pictures with friends and family. And uh, one of the common questions I get is, how did you get into sea turtles? And there's always that moment when you become passionate about something. I think Angie was kind of touching on it as well, too. There's always that moment. And my moment was in 1996. I was attending Florida Atlantic University. I was studying psychobiology, the biological basis of behavior, essentially looking into abnormal psychology, trying to figure out the environmental factors influencing human behavior. Not exactly the sea turtle world. <laughs> and in between classes, uh, to relieve stress of the normal day life, I would walk to beaches and I would surf quite a bit. And one day I met a girl who was conducting sea turtle patrol in Boca Raton. And she told me the story of sea turtles, explaining how they're these canary in the coal mine for the state of the world's oceans. And also explaining about some of the flight of them and how these indicator species for a greater whole of what we're looking at. And explained the effects of coastal lighting, beach nourishment, et cetera, et cetera, that was going on in South Florida. And between the story of sea turtles and her passion, I was hooked. I thought, I need to figure out more about these sea turtles. And lo and behold, I then married that girl. <laughs> and we still work with sea turtles. So it's been a great thing to keep it in the family. My son has grown up with sea turtles, and it's been an amazing way to live our lives. Secondly, some of the harder questions we get, and the one that I think those that do turtle patrol, et cetera, get these same questions. Um, how are turtles doing? Uh, it seems like a relatively simple question, and I'll give you the simple answer first. And then I'll go into a little bit more of the detail that we're looking at. Uh, simply put, sea turtle nesting is going really well. Uh, we're, in, we're higher than we've been for loggerhead nesting, green turtle nesting, leatherback nesting. We're doing really well if we look at it for the long-term trend. Uh, if we look site-specific and we discuss the nesting that we've seen here at GTO, it's almost two different stories. What we saw prior to 2010 and then what we saw after 2010. Uh, sea turtle monitoring started here at the GTM Research Reserve in 1987. It's about 27 years ago. All told, it was about uh, 5,400 survey effort days. If you strung those all together and we had consistent surveying, that would be 14 years of surveying straight. Uh, during that time, we documented around 2,000 nests, and we have released around 230,000 hatchlings. So it's no small feat that we've been working on for this long of a period of time. Now, I haven't been doing it here for that long, but it's definitely been quite a project. Um, if we were to look at trends and how things are going, we can, like I said, we have that before and after 2010. So if we look at 1987 to, say, 2009, we averaged about 72 nests per year. Uh, we would have a low of around 30 and a high right around 100. And if we look at 2010, we magically had 252. So we had this massive jump, two and a half fold jump that we saw in nesting. Um, and it's kind of been a trickle down a little bit since there, too. So here in 2014, we have right around 133. And there's a lot of conflicting reports. We're seeing news reports saying that nesting is dropping off in Northeast Florida. We're seeing that statewide we're off. What the short answer is, is long-term trends can't be assessed on one-year data sets, um, particularly for sea turtles. Uh, sea turtles, uh, they take a long maturation. So we're looking at roughly 20 to 25 years for a single sea turtle to become sexually mature. So in our sampling period, we're really looking at only one maturation period of a sea turtle. So a sea turtle that emerged back in 1987 is just now starting to come back around and start nesting on our beaches. And also given the prehistoric nature of sea turtles, we're really only viewing a very small window into their nesting. Uh, we can't have a full concept of their trends. So to support some of this long-term nesting, uh, I stumbled across a great article in the journal Nature this month that emphasized the importance of these long-term projects. Uh, and it was also eliciting an idea that a lot of new discoveries come out of these long-term projects that sometimes we don't might see as that hot new thing. Um, and I was trying to think back to you know, some of the, the hot spots that we've had here at GTM, some of the recent publications and notability. Uh, and I'll just name a couple, there's quite a few. Uh, and back in 2010, we noted some very odd sea turtle eggs. Uh, for those that don't know, sea turtle eggs usually look like ping pong balls. Uh, the eggs we encountered were about six to eight inches and looked like sweet potatoes. Um, very odd. 
Uh, so we started following up some other researchers around the world, and we actually found that it's a lot more common in Australia, but relatively undocumented here in the United States. And we were the first here at GTM to document that here in the United States. Secondly, another notable event was we documented the predation of sea turtles by alligators. Uh, we were the first to document that. It has now been cited in the sea turtle textbooks, um, the one aptly named The Biology of Sea Turtles, Volume 3. Plug, plug. Um, <laughs> so it's definitely you know, getting us onto that mark. These are things that have come out of some of this long term monitoring. Other issues that we've done, we've also done some of the first satellite tracks of juvenile sea turtles in the near shore natural waters of Northeast Florida, the Guana Reserve here getting insight into some of that habitat, some of that use that we're seeing in this area by those species. Uh, another project we worked on, and this is a very unique project we were working on with the University of Georgia. We were trying to determine the subpopulation limits of sea turtles through genetic analysis. So what we were trying to find out was pretty much, are our sea turtles more related to the ones in Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina, or are our turtles related to the ones in Peninsular Florida and South Florida? We found out that our turtles are indeed more related to the ones in Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina. And to follow that up, we were actually able to even track a single female that nested in Ponte Vedra Beach and then several weeks later nested in South Carolina, shedding light on into the site fidelity understanding that we have in sea turtles. And I'll give you one more, and this is even bigger for the side of conservation. Uh, our nesting data that we submit to the state, to the federal government, and our comments have gone into the designation of critical habitat for the loggerhead sea turtle. Uh, you may have heard about some of the terrestrial and marine dedications that we've had for the critical habitat. It is the largest designation of critical habitat thus far in the records. So it's a huge movement for conservation. <coughs> Excuse me, I need some water with that. Celebrate that. I'll go over some more of the other questions. So another question I received, uh, that this one's a little bit more difficult to answer. And I get this sometimes with the press or even with family members. And their general questions of why do we need sea turtles? Or why do we need to monitor sea turtles? And I've been looking for those nice uh, analogies or uh, mental images to look at to be able to simplify our response to that so that, oh, ask and you shall receive. And it's worked out that in my response to why do we need to monitor sea turtles, one of the simplest answers, and I talk about with the oceans and everything else, is that oceans and beaches that are good for sea turtles are also good for people. So that's a good indicator. It's back to that indicator species of larger dynamics that we're looking at. The tougher question is, why do we need sea turtles? And uh, many, many biologists will try to answer that question all day long. And there's many different models and analogies that we look at in ecology for the interconnectedness of animals in the ecosystem. And some of the my more famous ones are rivets in an airplane, and I can go on and on and on about textbooks that I've read about interconnectedness of all the ecosystems. But I came up with my own analogy. Um, if you think of the game Jenga, uh, it's a small game where you have small wooden blocks and you stack them up into a column and the, uh, I guess the players individually remove pieces and you're never quite sure which piece that they pull out is going to make the tower collapse, but that last piece, that person's labeled the loser of that game, supposedly. And if we look at this in ecology, if we were to label each of those pieces, either a plant, an animal, uh, an endangered species, something along that lines, and we're to take it out of that tower, we're never quite sure which piece that's going to be to make that tower collapse. And that being said, I'd like to argue that it might be sea turtles. Um, I might be biased on that a little bit. But <laughs> if we went around the room, we'd probably all pick our own different species. But I think it's a good way to take a look at how ecosystems work and know how each different individual piece has an important role. The other question we get quite a bit is, how can we protect sea turtles? And I, again, have tried to find these simplified analogies and, and simplified points to get this across. To, usually I'm interacting with people very quickly on the beach, the press, they want a very quick sound bite. Um, a couple years ago, I was listening to a sea turtle biologist by the name of Wallace J. Nichols. Uh, some of you may have heard of him discussing his book, Blue Mind, uh, talking about the neural connection to humans and water. Uh, he's been around TV quite a bit lately. Also a sea turtle biologist. Um, and in his presentation, 
he said that. To protect our oceans and coastal systems, he's got a simple solution. We need to put less in, take less out, and watch the margins. And I was like, aha, that's very easy. Let's see, I can repeat that over and over again. So to flesh that out, so to put less in, we need to put less pollution into our waterways, less marine debris, less non-point point source pollution into our water bodies. Um, to take less out, we need to know more about sustainable fisheries. We need to know more about bycatch, limiting incidental take, having more events like this that are promoting information about sustainable seafood. It's a great way to get going. Now to watch the margins, that's a little bit more of a fuzzier area. It needs a little bit more explanation. So to watch the margins, we need to be mindful of our coastal development. We need to be mindful of large-scale projects such as beach renourishment, beach driving, beach lighting, jetty systems, etc. We also need to be mindful of our small-scale recreational activities such as building a sandcastle on the beach, leaving chairs on the beach, digging holes in the beach. All of these have significant impacts on our species and our oceans and everything collectively. So with that being said, I'd like to say that it's events like this that help get out that, that motion of conservation and help spread that information. So all of us here are contributing to that already. Uh, and I'd like to coin this term, I guess, already, that you know, it makes us a little bit more ocean-wise. We can actually start to use it as an adjective and become more ocean-wise. And I also have to add, and I'll wrap it up a little bit, that you could not do any of this work at all without the support of the Friends of the Earth, without the support of Drummond, Without those folks that have adopted nests on our beaches to help fund our projects, and all the countless volunteers that have come out and dedicated their time and their effort relentlessly throughout this 14 years of monitoring uh, to be able to achieve these goals. And with that, I want to say thank you. <laughs>